God, we thank you that you are our Father, God. We thank you that your grace has never ended. God, as Matthew said, you're, you're uncomprehendable to us, God, and, and we thank you for that. We thank you for uh, the new journeys we can take with you every day, God. And God, I pray for this message, God. I pray that um, you can open up people's hearts just now, God, for it, and, and we can see lives changed as a result of what people are, are hearing from you today, God. And God, we pray that it's relevant, it's timely, and God, we pray that, um, yeah, we pray that see lives changed today, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Feel free to have a seat, guys. Thanks, man. Good job as usual. Matthew, absolutely amazing. Some of the details in these songs there, you know. Matthew puts in a lot of effort. He does an amazing job, amazing job. I'm just going to hop straight into the Word, if that's okay today. If everyone wants to grab their Bibles, no no jokes at the start. I'm not good enough. They're probably not appropriate for a Sunday service anyway. Um, so if everyone, straight to the Bibles. Um, and again, always, I say this when I start. If you like what you hear, let me know. Um, if you don't like what you hear, don't let me know. Just be quiet. Uh, no, nah, I'm just joking. Right, let's look at Acts 1, uh, verses 4 to 8. Everyone got that? Uh, I think you're lying, actually, yes. Um, let's look at Acts 1, yeah, 1, 1, 4 to 8. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So just notice the emphasis of time there. Wait for the gift in a few days. He's speaking to them about the gift that he's going to give them in the future, uh, the Holy Spirit. He's already died on the cross by this point. He's risen from the dead. Uh, he's about to send to heaven. Uh, he's about to give them the gift, and he's telling them that they're going to have to wait for it a little bit. Um, on to number six. Uh, then he gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? It sounds like they're getting a bit impatient. Are you at this time? They want to know exactly when and where. Now, Verse 7, he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father is set by his authority. So to me, he said, I'm the boss, don't question me. That's what I'm hearing there. Now, on to 8, but you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, you see a lot of emphasis on time there, and in that one as well, you know, it's not for you to know the times or dates, but you will receive the power. So today I'm going to talk about the unscheduled God. Now, just out of interest, how do you guys say that? Let's have a let's have a hands up for schedule. Not many people. I think that's the I think that's the traditional British way of saying it. Hands up for schedule. All right, there's more. I'm going to go with schedule then. Sorry, guys, you're outvoted. Um, so yeah, the unscheduled God. Now, that's not me saying God doesn't have a schedule, right? He has an agenda. It's just not always the same as ours. Have we found that? Is that what you guys experience as well? You know. So what I mean when I say unscheduled God is he is, in fact, unscheduled by us. Um, we can choose his timings? No. He's unschedulable by us. Now, the first thing we need to understand about God's schedule is that it is perfect. There's no if, buts, or maybes around that. Um, just as all of God's ways are perfect, his schedule, his time, and his calendar is perfect. If you look at Psalm 18.30, as for God... His way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. He shields all who take refuge in him. Now, God's timing is never early. It's never late. Yeah. It may feel like that to us from our kind of way of thinking. But in fact, from before our birth until right now, until the moment we take our last breath on earth, God is using us in his way to fulfill his purpose in our lifetimes. Yeah. Now, he is in complete control of everything as we see here. And everything that he does is perfect from end to end. No event ever in all of it, this is just setting a background for this, no event in our history at all has even scratched the surface of affecting God's timing and God's plan. He designed it before the foundation of the world, so we don't have the ability to affect that. Now, God does have a plan, but I want to look at how we think when it comes to God's schedule and how we act around his schedule and his timing. Now, I'll be honest, I can be really organized for some things. I work in a coordinator role, so I'm used to scheduling interviews and and making things happen, speaking to people externally, you know, I have to be organized for that. When it comes to my personal life, not so much. Um, so I can be unorganized for some things and organized for others, and most people are like that. For example, preparing the sermon. This sermon definitely didn't check my calendar before it popped in in November. You know, I, didn't, I had a plan how November was going to go, this sermon came in. You know, it was one night this week where me and Nikki were watching TV, and we're just chilling, and we're about 11 o'clock, we're ready to go to bed, and I just felt God urging me, nope, this is time to prepare a sermon. This is my time. And 
sometimes God does have to remind you that his schedule is bigger than ours. Now, I am I'm quite... I like to I like, I have a meal plan, I have a budget plan, I uh, have a to-do list, a schedule and a calendar. Now, I've sent the guys an image of just on my calendar next week. It's not too busy, but I like to pack it in, as you can see there. I've got, um, if we can keep that up on screen there, see, repot plants. That was a really important part of my life that I put in six months ago, so I needed to remember to do that. So some things are organized, some things aren't. Get the Christmas tree and decorate was not me, I can assure you that. That was Nikki. I would not be doing that in November. But this just gives you an idea. I like, to, I like to schedule some things. I like to have everything planned out. This is a genuine screenshot from my calendar on Google. Now, I plan in dinner. Nikki, she has to have dinner at exactly 6 o'clock every night or I'll be upset. Now, this is, I would say this is, this is a relatively quiet week. Some weeks I have a connect group on a Tuesday. So this is an idea of my calendar. And I think we, what I find quite often is um, we don't always have a choice in what changes. Um, but yeah, that was just to give you a wee idea. Lewis and Clark for lunch on Saturday. I'm looking forward to it. Right. <laughs> and it is good to plan things out. I'm not saying it's not. I'm not saying it's bad to plan out your work week. You can see there I have reminders for me to get the bus. Um, but some things just don't fit your schedule. So we need to rethink about what we're prioritizing. God doesn't check our calendar to do list. He doesn't need our permission. He doesn't need Google to tell us on, his, on our calendar when the right time for him to work is. Um, so God, sometimes God is just unschedulable. Some things you just can't schedule. Some things won't consult your calendar. Now, I've been married for over a year now. It feels like about five, but no, I'm only joking. Oh. Guys, I'm joking. I'm joking. You can laugh if we're in church. Now, I found out that in that time that you can have a plan that can change in an instant. Oh, Connor, I want Domino's for dinner. Oh, but I've, I've prepped chicken. I've got stuff in the fridge. I bought it two weeks ago. Actually, no, I, don't, I would go for a Domino's there, to be fair. But some things just don't consult your calendar. Now, do we sometimes feel off schedule? God, what should I do now? Just in life generally, unsure of what God has for us next or when this season's going to end or when the next season's going to pop up or when this, this problem's going to fix itself. It's been months now, God. Or when I'm going to get a better job or, or something like that. So, so when we look back at the word, by this point in Acts, Acts 1, the disciples have been through a lot with Jesus. You know, the cross is over. That's done. They're asking what's next. What's happening next? So they're unsure. Um, so Acts 1 to 6, they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They're asking what's next. You know, as I said, they've had the cross. When are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And I think we, we can get like the disciples in this way as well, to be honest. What's next? I've got nothing in the calendar. I need it scheduled. I need to know what's happening next. I need to be comfy. I need to be happy. I need to, I need to approve it. You know, God knows what's next. I don't know what to do. Everything's crazy nowadays. What do I do? What are my next steps? So I want to have a wee look at what we do while we, were, while we are waiting. Now, we don't often think about waiting when we look at the amazing events, events in the Bible. We think, oh, that's a miracle. When we look at, you know, Abraham and Sarah, they had to wait for a son. Joseph waited for a promotion. Moses waited to lead, lead the Israelites to the promised land. Ruth waited for a husband. David waited to become king. Elijah waited for the rain. Paul waited for the release from prison. So, Throughout the Bible, we see people have had to wait for these miracles to come through. And in those times of waiting, these people, we can see when you read the scripture, that they were called to serve their families and those around them, serve the world, uh, learn about and listen expectantly to what God has for them, um, to pray without ceasing, not to grumble, not to complain, to fulfill the ordinary works of God. Now, they're not glamorous, showy, or exciting, but we see these miracles and we think, they've had to wait as well. So, Here's a thought. Are you allowing the waiting game to prepare you for what's ahead? You have to allow it. Now, are you allowing this, un there's a lot of uncertainty at the moment, this uncertain period of life, unstable period of life, strange season, are you allowing it to prepare you for what's ahead rather than just looking straight forward? Now, there's loads of amazing examples um, and amazing people that have had to wait for blessings. Now, you may ask, to do, you may ask though, what do I actually do while I'm waiting? What do I actually do? God has a few ideas on this one, I'm afraid. It's definitely not to sit and do nothing. You know, God, what's next? Oh, what can I do? God knows what you can do. You can love your neighbor. Matthew 22, 37, 39. What do I do now, Lord? I, I'm, I'm confused. I don't know what to do. Present your request to me. I'm waiting. Philippians. God, you're not telling me what to do about this person, this relationship. I'm struggling with this. I, I don't feel your help. Forgive us, Christ forgave you. You know, it's written in the word already. God, what's up next for me? I've heard, I've heard nothing from you recently. What's coming up for me? Do nothing from selfish ambition, but in humility count others more significant as ourselves. Philippians. You no, know, if you think 
that you're not hearing from God and you feel like you're off schedule, refer back to his word. Yeah, it's his word. As, as we can see here, maybe we need to tighten up to God's word before we truly hear from him and we can be guided. And I did speak about this in the last time I spoke uh, on stage and like, to not let the next time you hear from God and let him guide you be the next Sunday service. It's too far apart. You're creating too big a gap. It'll be harder to be guided by God because you're not as close to his word. And his word is what guides you. Not everyone hears an audible, audible voice. Now, just a quick thought before our next point. God is immutable. So when I was looking at the meaning of this, um, unchanging over time or unable to be changed by time. How cool is that? God won't change over time. The God that done these amazing things is the God that's working with us now. He doesn't change with time. So we'll save that in your mind for later on because we're going to come back to that. Now, I want to look at another question. Why does God make us wait? Because he doesn't have to. We know he's all powerful. So I want to have a, a wee look into this and why he actually calls us to wait on purpose. He does it for his glory and to make us more like Jesus. That's one reason. You know, Jesus' whole life, if you look at it on the, on the surface, it looked like a waiting game. Um, he waited for the disciples. He waited for crowds to arrive. He waited for his parents. Uh, he waited for crucifixion. He waited for uh, glorification. He's waiting for his return. His life, death, and resurrection are evidence of faithful waiting. Now, we want to be more like him, yeah? That's what we're called to do. Yet, he's much more than just an example. He's our actual hope. Yeah. So when waiting, and it kind of saps the joy out of you if you're not enjoying the situation, and you can feel overwhelmed and afraid of what's coming, Jesus is our hope. Yeah. He's an example and our hope. Jesus is a brother and a friend who will give you strength when you need it through relationship and his example, as we've seen here, his waiting example. God's love and his wisdom means that he knows that waiting is best for you. His grace, kindness, strength, goodness, as we looked at earlier in the word, the solid in writing word of God will help you persevere and push through that waiting. Now, and we do need to learn to wait. That's a problem. There is a time and a place for things to happen, but God works through the waiting. God doesn't make us wait because he's out of evilness or malice. That's not at all. That's not him. That's not his nature. As we see in Exodus, Exodus 34, 6, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth. He's not, it's not out of malice. It's not out of evilness. It's a, it's a benefit to us. So that isn't him or his nature, but he does make us wait in love and wisdom, even if we are not a fan of that, which I know I am in sometimes. And he's working through our waiting. First off, he does it to increase our trust or our faith in him. He uses the waiting to increase our trust and loosen our perceived control over situations. Like without, God, without trusting that God's got control over the situation and I'm reminding us we are, we're taking control of it ourselves. Now, waiting reminds us that we're at the mercy, literally at the mercy of God and at his timing and his schedule and his calendar. And unfortunately, we have no power to change that. We crave control, but that this is waiting is a way God can show us of his power and his greatness. It pulls the situations from our grip. It makes us ask hard questions like, are we going to give up on ourselves and trust in God fully? Now, waiting, another way, another way that waiting can develop you is waiting on God's schedule also allows us to put our idols to death. So God uses this period of waiting and when you're uncertain what going on, what's going on to get rid of our idols. You know, we live in an accomplishment-driven culture. It's not necessarily wrong to accomplish things, but when your value is measured and marked by what you've done, it can be dangerous. Now, that's not how our God works or how he defines us. He tells us how he defines us. Um, and amen to that, because you wouldn't want to be defined by what you've done. Now, how much you get defined, if how much uh, you, you get done defines your worth instead of God, this is idolizing the things that you do, the tasks that you do, what you've achieved, yeah. rather than idol and God. Now, by waiting on God and his timing, his plan, his schedule destroys that. Now, are we putting our worth in plans and productivity, or are we putting our worth in God? Yeah, looking at Galatians 6, 9. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap the harvest, if we do not give up. Yeah. Again, in the waiting. So put to death what we want and be patient. We still have things to do for God in the meantime, as we looked at earlier. So I'm going to change gears a little bit and look at another verse, looking at Genesis 12, 1 to 2, looking at um, the call of Abraham. So the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country, your people, and your father's household 
to the land I will show you. By the way, he's 75 when he's getting told this. That's a bit rough. Now, <laughs> and he is saying here, I will show you. Not that I have shown you. I'm going to show you to make you feel comfortable about the situation first, give you a full debriefing, stick it in your calendar. Now, he's saying, go, and I will, go you. I will show you. Sorry, Take the step. Now, looking at verse 2. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. So there's a promise, I will show you. That's God's promise. And then there's a process, I will make you. This is the process that follows the promise that God made to Abraham. So I'd like to look at the idea that the promise may follow a process. Process meaning a series of actions or steps taken over time in order to achieve a particular end goal. God is saying here, in this verse in Genesis, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. He's saying, I am going to bless you. I gave you a job to pay you, but I will bless you. I've given you a house to keep you warm, but I will bless you. You know, I think we do a great job at thanking God for the blessings he gives us. You know, our job, our family, our house. But we need to remember and refer back to the source of the blessing. You know, it's not just the blessing itself and looking at it on the outside. Now, if someone makes you food... Just to let you know, I love when people make me food. Just putting it out there. You don't thank the pot it was served in. You thank the person who made the food. Now, let's remember the source of the food. The one who's come up with the idea. Who's chopped, boiled, fried, prepped, spent hours on the idea. God is that person. You know, it's important we remember the source of the blessing. And that's God, by the way, in case that wasn't obvious enough. Um, So here's another few thoughts. A few facts about God. God is immutable. We looked at that earlier. He doesn't change. He is impeccable. So he's perfect. He doesn't make mistakes. And that includes you. Looking at Psalm 1830 again. As, as for God, his way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. He shields all who take refuge in him. And he is incomprehensible. We will never fully understand God. That means we don't always know how it's going to happen, even if we know who's going to make it happen. Now, Matthew kind of spoke on that a little bit earlier about how we can constantly be learning about God, how, about how he's above our understanding. And that is amazing because we don't always have to be the one worrying about how it's going to happen or when it's going to happen, as long as we know who's making it happen and we're guided by the right person. Yeah. Now, and that is an important one, so I'm going to go through them again. Um, and as Pastor Glenn would say, write it on your neighbor's leg and you can photocopy it later. I've not heard that in a long time. <laughs> now, he is immutable. He doesn't change. He is impeccable. He's perfect. Doesn't make mistakes. He is incomprehensible. That means that we don't always know how it's going to happen or when it's going to happen, even if we know who is going to happen, who will make it happen. Yeah? Yeah. Again, God is unschedulable. He's incomprehensible, which means that we don't always know, again, or have an understanding of how it's going to happen. I think that's so important that we release control there. It says in Isaiah, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, Neither are, my way, are your ways my ways, declared the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. This means that he doesn't think like you. He doesn't act like you. He's not bound by the same things you're bound by. That may sound obvious, but it's, it's massive. So let's look at the next point. It is never not on time. So that's when I'm saying it's never not on time. That's God's will or God's blessings. It's never not on time. What I mean by that is when God's in it, it's never too late, never too early. It's never too late or never too early to be blessed by God. Yeah? Yeah. Now, looking back at Genesis 12, when God was telling Abraham to go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. So again, Abraham was 75 at that point. No offense to anyone who's 75 or older in the room. um, No names being named. um, But it's a lot of work to get started on at that age. Um, now, it really does show you that God doesn't need a human schedule to accomplish his purpose. Isn't that great? Now, he's not limited by your humanness. You don't need to be limited by your humanness, if that's a word. But God especially is not limited by your human form and your, yeah, humanness. Yeah, we need the humanity. There you go. That's great, Tress. Thank you. Now, God is saying, I don't need to check your calendar to bless you. Abraham was an old man. He didn't check Abraham's biological calendar. Now, you might say, but, right, that's fair enough. Abraham is old, but I'm too young. I'm too young for what God has for me. Again, that's lies. We see tons of evidence in the Bible of young people stepping up and young people carrying God's word. And, and so just one example that 
the, we all know the story of um, Jesus feeding the 5,000. Like in John 6, one example of a million of young people saving the day. So this young boy um, supporting the disciples and what they were doing by giving up his lunch. Look at what a, what a miracle was done in that situation just by an action of a young boy. Age didn't come into, and didn't factor in there. He wasn't not holy enough because he was whatever age he was. Oh, you need to be in your 30s before you can start doing stuff like that. No. Yeah. You're not too young. Don't say I'm only a youth. Don't limit God to human timelines. You don't have the authority to do that. I know that sounds a bit harsh, but who do you think you are? <laughs> you're te- you telling God that, that I'm limiting you to my, my age, my timeline. No. Terrible. Now, Acts 1 to 7. I read it at the start. He said, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. It's again speaking to Abraham. You're putting boundaries on God. No. Anyway, if God is in it, it's going to be on time. It's never not on time. Now, check your schedule. We know what God says about your schedule. This is the day the Lord has made. Every day. Now, if God's in it, it's on time. It's not too late, not too early. It's not a bad time. Philippians 4, 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Yeah. Present your request to your Father. God is a Father, right? Right? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Present your request to God. Dad, is it a bad time? No, come on, you don't do that. More like, Dad, I need a lift. Now, right now, come on. <laughs> now, anyway, yeah. Child of God, it's never a bad time. Present your request to me. He's telling us to do that. But I'm single, so it's a bad time. I have young kids, it's a bad time for me. My back's really sore, my back is sore. It's a bad time. I'm not ready yet for that. That's not for me just now. It's a bad time. I'm not perfect. It's a bad time for you to do that, God. I can't help that person, I'm not perfect. It's too late. It's over. It's a bad time. I'm too young, come back later. I'm not ready for that yet. The blessing's passed me, it's done. I should have prayed for that back in February. It's too late now. Stop limiting God to your humanness. Stop limiting God to your time ends and stop limiting God to your calendar. Your schedule. If God tells you it's time, guess what? It's time. (laughs) Now, if that happens and you're talking yourself out of God's timing, that is a lie from the devil getting a hold of you. It 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 might sound harsh, but I did speak about this previously when I spoke before as well. In John 8, 44, Jesus is speaking to this uh, group of uh, Jewish people and he's saying, you belong to your father, the devil, and you carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding on to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. He is a father of lies. God speaks the truth, the devil lies. It sounds so simple, but it's essential that we understand that, know it, and believe it as true, that the devil lies. Because he wants to convince you that he doesn't lie. And that these thoughts are the truth. These thoughts of, I'm not good enough, or I'm too old, I'm too young, I'm not ready for that yet. He wants to convince you that that's the truth. Deception is a tactic of the devil. Now, it lit- deception literally means to believe a lie. So if someone's deceived, they're believing a lie and that's not true. And because they believe it, it can, as I've said before, it can become the reality. And that is very dangerous. Now, if you don't answer God's calling because you decide you're too old, too young, not smart enough, too busy, then I'm afraid if it works against God's will and what God's asked you to do, it's not of God, it's of the devil, it's a lie. Now, we need to bind these thoughts that we're not good enough, that we're, this isn't the right time, it's a bad time, I'm too old, I'm too young, as I've said, I'm not quite good enough yet, I'm not perfect. We need to bind these thoughts, break them off our lives, hand them over to God, break their power over our lives, ask God to take captive the thought and destroy it. Destroy the thought of, that blessing's past me now, it's done, God's, God's done with me. You're still here, aren't you? God's not done with you. As we sang in uh, my testimony, you're still here. God's not done with you. Again, it's lies of the devil to tell you you're not ready or you're, you're past it. So live by God's schedule. Amen? Uh, let's pray. God, we pray that um, you can take captive of these thoughts this morning, God. These thoughts that say we're, this is a bad time. We're not good enough for you. God, we, we break them. We bind them. We break them. We make these thoughts obedient to you, God. We break them off our lives this morning, God. And build us up to understand that your schedule is the one that matters, not ours. And allow us to be flexible with that, God. Uh, God, I pray for everyone in this room, as I've said, God, and we pray that our lives can understand your calendar and your schedule, your timeline, your plan. 
um, understand them in our way. We don't need to know everything that's going on, God, but we can have that peace that you're in control. Your timeline is in control. And it allows us to be comfortable in the waiting, God. And, and God, we pray for um, we pray for everyone in this room, God. We pray that, that that thought can that thought of you're in control, God, can become apparent in our lives, God, as we as we go about our weeks, God, and, and about our lives, God, and we can understand that you've got this. We don't have to have it all. We don't have to have it all under control, God. We can um, relinquish that up to you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you haven't committed to God or handed over your calendar to him or your schedule to him, made him a number one priority, or if you've not said yes to a relationship with him, if you've been working on your own schedule for too long or on your own timings or on your own calendar and you want God to take control today, he can give you the opportunity to say yes to a relationship with him. We do it every Sunday. Now, if God's telling you today, this is the time to step out your schedule into my schedule blessings for you, then you can repeat this after me. Everyone's going to do it. No one's looking around. No one's listening to you. So it won't stand out. So if this is your time, pray after me. Jesus, I thank you that you loved me and died for me. Thank you that you rose again. I know I've sinned. Forgive me for this. I choose today to live life your way, not my way. Teach me your ways. Thank you for saving me. Amen. If that is the first time that you've prayed that prayer, um, with all heads bowed, everyone in the room, heads bowed, eyes closed, no one's looking around, just slip up your hand and we can give you something after the service. If that is your first time, just put up your hand today and um, we can support you in that.